because we do think it is important and also um, because it does impact our daily lives and may impact some of the work that we do here. So um, the coronavirus, what is a virus? It's a, a biologic agent that reproduces inside the cell of a living host, which could be an animal, a plant, uh, insects. My honeybees get viruses, not this one, but they can get viruses, um, and bacteria. So a virus simply is uh, something that reproduces in the cell of a living host. And of course, we're familiar with some of these diseases that viruses cause. Um, mono from Epstein-Barr -Barr virus, chicken pox, the flu. So what's a coronavirus? A uh, coronavirus was given the name because when they looked at it with a scanning electron microscope, it had this halo. Um, around it. And so it looked like the, uh, a crown or the corona, if you're familiar with the light effect that you can see up north. And so that's why they called it a coronavirus. Um, if a person is infected with a coronavirus, most of the time that person's just going to have mild, what we would call upper respiratory symptoms, a runny nose, maybe a slight cough. This is one of the viruses that causes the common cold. The coronavirus is a large family. So when we give as scientists names to these viruses, we'll start with a family name and then we may give them extra numbers or letters. And so coronavirus is a word that really is uh, referring to this family. So there are many coronaviruses in the world and there have been very dangerous coronaviruses in the past. Um, actually within this uh, past decade, one that was very dangerous um, uh, was found in the Middle East. Um, and so, um, so anyway, a dangerous virus is not new and a dangerous virus from this family is not new. So why are we doing this little talk tonight and why is this important for you? You probably already know, but within the past few months, we have had a new coronavirus uh, it has now been given the name Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. Uh, so SARS-CoV-2. And the virus causes the disease, abbreviated COVID-19, Coronavirus Disease 2019. We believe this virus first infected a human in China, uh, passed from an animal to a human and then has been transmitted from person to person since then. So why is it important to discuss this? Because the severity of disease from this virus can vary dramatically. Some people will experience very mild symptoms like the common cold, but others will have a much more severe, severe illness leading to severe respiratory symptoms and possibly even respiratory failure. So, if you were in an automobile accident in the year 2018 in this country, um, there were about 36,560 people who died. And of, all, of those accidents, that yielded about 11 deaths for every 100,000. Um, the mortality from the flu, so this data from the flu is still being calculated and worked through, but we estimate in the year 2017 to 2018, that flu season, that winter that was 2017 into 2018, that there were about 61,000 people who died out of 45 million people who had the flu. So that would be about 135 deaths for every 100,000 people who had the flu. So compared to that, for this illness, so far what we've had is over 5,000 deaths from 153,000 confirmed cases, which gives us a death of 3,739 people per 100,000 people who are infected. So hopefully what I'm showing you is that this is significantly worse than your chance of dying in an automobile accident or from the flu. Now, in all fairness, the death rate will probably go down because there are probably a lot of people in the community that have this and have very mild symptoms. So they are not a confirmed case because we have not tested them, they have not sought treatment because their symptoms are mild. And so the death rate may go down. But even if it goes down tenfold, that's still 
300 people per 100,000, which is double the death rate from the flu. So, um, this is a more lethal virus. It also appears to be more contagious than the flu. So when we talk about an illness, an infectious disease, one of the things that's important to know is if you have it, what are the chances that you're going to spread it to somebody? If the chance of spreading it is less than one, that means eventually it's going to die out. The, that is that illness because you're not spreading it to another person every time. But for this illness so far, we estimate that every person who has it is going to spread it to two or three more people. And so the number of infected are increasing very dramatically, very quickly. In the state of Tennessee, as of 2 o'clock this afternoon, the health department updated that we have 39 cases, none in Wilson County so far. The highest number is in Davidson County, Nashville. There have been people in Wilson County tested, but so far we do not have any confirmed cases. One thing about the test, the way it's done in the United States right now is it takes a few days to get a result. Our um, labs and our government is working on a test so that you can get a result the same day, but we do not have that available yet from offices like mine or Dr. Anderson's or our hospital. And so these samples that we collect, we send to a lab and we get a result back in three or four days. So how is it spread? Person to person through droplets. Um, being within approximately six feet of a person with this illness for a long, prolonged period of time is a way that it's transmitted. Having direct contact with a person who's infected. Um, their secretions, their sputum, their blood, uh, respiratory droplets. So if you've seen those slow motion videos of somebody sneezing, that's what we're talking about. But the thing is, even when you're not sneezing and just breathing, we're going to have some moisture, some water vapor come out of our respiratory tract. Can you get something like this from touching a doorknob? Well, we still have a lot to learn about this virus. Coronaviruses can live on the surface of something like a doorknob or a countertop for a few days. And so the scientists estimate the same thing for this virus. It does appear to live on surfaces for three or four days. It is thought that the risk of infection from something like that is low, but we can't say 0% chance, so caution is advised. That's why you're seeing stores and restaurants advertise that they are cleaning their surfaces. I went to um, Panera Bread for lunch this afternoon. I got it to go, and right there on the door was a piece of paper um, reassuring the customers that they are cleaning their surfaces routinely. So what are the symptoms? Sinus congestion, cough, elevated temperature. One of the charts I looked at, over 87% of people who had confirmed cases, this was about 55,000 confirmed cases, over 87% had a fever. Um, with more severe cases, a person can have trouble breathing and confusion. So when should somebody seek medical attention? If a person has more severe symptoms, they definitely need to seek medical attention. And that would be the person who has that respiratory distress, difficulty breathing, that has the alteration of mental status. If a person has mild symptoms starting out, a runny nose, what they think is just a cold, but then it progresses from there, or maybe they have a time period where they get a little better and then get worse, that's another time that we encourage people to seek medical attention. One of the problems with this illness and its testing in this country was that initially we said, okay, if you have not had travel outside of the country, specifically to China, if you do not have a fever, then you probably don't need to be tested and need to worry about it. Unfortunately, though, like I said before, there are probably people in the community who have had mild symptoms and have not sought care and therefore have been able to spread it unknowingly. 
as we get better testing available, then we may encourage people to seek medical attention for milder cases just so we know how prevalent this is and so the individuals may know so they don't spread it to other people who are higher risk. So who is at the highest risk of developing complications from this? Adults, specifically adults over the age of 40, and really your greatest risk increase is going to be people over the age of 60. Um, people with chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, and lung disease. For the population 60 and above, the mortality rate is 6%, and that increases significantly with each decade. So when you look at people 70 above, 80 and above, your mortality rate increases significantly. So one of the reasons that we wanted to present this information is just to be bluntly honest, a lot of our members are going to fit in this high-risk category. That is 60 and above. One of the things that is probably important to note is if you do seek medical attention, it's probably a good idea to maybe call ahead wherever you're going. Certainly, as soon as you get there, notify whoever's doing the initial intake or triage that you have respiratory symptoms and a fever. You should be given a mask immediately. The masks that you see on like TV with the surgeons that they wear, those don't necessarily prevent other people from getting this because when you breathe, air can move in through the sides of the mask. But what it does do is when you exhale, if you have something, it will catch some of those particles, some of those droplets, and so it may reduce the amount of droplets that you spread out when you exhale. So if you're sick, going to some type of um, uh, doctor's office or emergency room or hospital, then uh, you should be given a mask to wear. One of the things that some offices are doing or may be doing is have a person wait in the car if they know you're sick. So in other words, you come in, say, hey, I'm sick, I'm concerned. They may say, okay, wait in your car for a few minutes, give us your cell phone number, we'll call you. That way you can come in and not be exposed to anybody else in the waiting room or expose anybody else. So can you get tested? We've had several phone calls from people who say, I just got back from a trip to New York. Um, I have a friend who just got back from travel. I feel fine. I don't have any symptoms myself. I just want to see, do I have this? Unfortunately, we do not have what we call a point of care test right now. That's a test where you can get the result back immediately. What we have is something that we send out and takes three or four days. And not all offices even have this available yet. Um, so the recommendation right now is if you don't have symptoms and you're just curious, don't get tested right now. We just don't have that um, availability and quantity of tests to do that at this time. The supply of tests we anticipate will increase and so in the future, we may see more recommendations for earlier testing, but right now we're prioritizing people who are at the highest risk, specifically those people who have traveled, those people who have a fever and upper respiratory symptoms, and then, of course, if you have a known contact. So what if I have mild symptoms? Should I seek medical care? Maybe not. So here's one of those things that's kind of tricky and just to be bluntly honest, we as a medical community are trying to figure out what to do because you still have the regular old coronavirus in the community. You still have adenovirus and parainfluenza and all these other things that make us sick. And people, yes, have seasonal allergies. And so a person may have their runny nose from the seasonal allergies as we see increased pollen and things start to bloom. Because we don't have resources for everybody, then if a person has very mild symptoms, it may be okay just to stay home and kind of sequester yourself. Um, Tylenol, Motrin, anti-inflammatory medications, if somebody is able to check on you just to make sure you're doing fine, have what you need to eat and drink, stuff like that. So a person who has very mild symptoms, especially if they're in the lower risk group, 20s and 30s, 
um, early 40s, it may be fine to stay home. Here's the thing. If you do have something, whatever you have, one of the things that I want to encourage everybody to do is don't give it to anybody else. So this is where simple things, covering your cough, sneeze into a tissue and then throw that away, stay home when you're sick. One of the problems with this illness is if we do see a lot of people who have very mild cases getting out in the public and exposing people who are higher risk, then we will utilize resources at a faster rate than we um, have available. So can you do anything to keep from getting infected? Avoid close contact with people who are sick, which goes back to if you're sick, do everybody else a favor and don't get out exposing other people. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Easier said than done. I know I touch my face a lot just out of habit, but that's one of those things that uh, I need to break. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. This is probably the best way to cleanse anything off of your hands. Yes, we have the um, alcohol-based hand sanitizers, but washing hands seems to be the best and most effective way. And clean surfaces that have a lot of contact frequently with disinfectants. This is especially important in public places. Is there a treatment? There's no specific treatment available at this time. Supportive care for those who develop severe symptoms and are in the hospital like IV fluid, support for their breathing, ventilators in extreme cases, Antiviral medications like what's used to treat people with HIV and AIDS are being experimented with and tested, but we do not have a specific treatment for this coronavirus at this time. Should I take vitamins or elderberry or supplements to prevent infection? We don't have any evidence that that will work. We do have evidence that um, elderberry may reduce your risk of getting the flu, that's in some studies a very small number of people. Um, so I'm not saying these things are bad, it's just for this specific illness we do not have evidence that supplements can reduce your risk of getting an infection. There is actually some concern that things that boost the immune system may end up causing harm. For those people who have more severe reactions to this illness, it's possible that our own immune systems are part of the problem. When we respond to an illness, if we release too many cytokines and too many pieces of our immune system, then we can develop more inflammation, fluid in our lungs that of course inhibit our breathing. And so if a person's taking something to try to boost their immune system, once you start getting sick with this illness, you probably want to stop it. Uh, when I say stop it, I mean things like elderberry, some of the vitamins. Vitamin C specifically is okay. You can keep taking your vitamin C, drink your orange juice, but the uh, immuno boosters probably are not a good idea if you're sick. So why all the hysteria? Why canceling public events? What's the deal with that? Some states have enacted, I say inactive, they have made recommendations for there not to be gatherings of 250 people or more. One of the privileges of living in this country is we have liberty. We can pretty much get out and do what we want. The government cannot say you have to stay home, you have to stay indoors. I say that. They kind of have in the past with tuberculosis, but in general, they can't tell us we cannot assemble. So we have that freedom to do it. but. Some states have made the recommendation that their citizens not gather in quantities of 250 people or more. And the idea is to limit how many people get infected and how fast it spreads through the population. There's some thought that eventually this is going to move through our population across the country, that we cannot limit it from moving through the country. But what we want to do, or let me rephrase that, we cannot stop it from moving through our citizens. But what we want to do is limit how fast it does that. If we don't have enough resources for everybody to get sick at the same time, so we need to spread it out. That's where you start seeing some of these terms, social distancing, 
flattening the curve. What does that mean? Social distancing is trying to stay away from other people so that you don't yourself get sick or if you are sick unknowingly, like I said, the person who has mild symptoms, so that you don't end up spreading it to other people. When you look at how fast this could grow, so if I'm infected and I infect two people here who then go and infect two to three people, who then go and infect two to three people, what you'll see is a curve that escalates and then has a dramatic, dramatic uptick. And that's where it will exhaust the capacity that we have to care for people. What we want to see is if people are going to get sick, that that curve is not a rocket ship shooting straight up, but it's a flatter, slower curve, and that the number of people who get sick stay below our ability to care for them. So that's when you see something or read something that's flattening the curve, that's what that's talking about. It's possible that children and young adults may have no symptoms or very mild symptoms, and so they may be spreading it without knowing it. And so when you look at these large social gatherings, you very easily could have people there who are sick and don't know it. So what am I proposing that we as Christians do? Number one, that we're as educated as we possibly can be because this is affecting the daily life daily routine of many people in our country. And it is, whether we want it to or not, going to affect us. We need to be as supportive as possible for those people who are sick and who are the most vulnerable for getting sick. So what does that mean? Well, I don't want sick people getting out and getting others infected. So this is one of those situations where if you are somebody who says, you know what? I've got a little cold, but I'm still going still gonna to get out and go to work or come to worship. Maybe now is not the time to, to do that. Uh, maybe now is the time to let your body heal. Uh, certainly, we don't want to expose those people who are more vulnerable. The next point, also do not want those who are the most vulnerable getting out and exposing them, themselves unnecessarily. So if you're in that population that's 60 years old and above, especially if you have diabetes, heart disease, or lung disease, like emphysema or chronic bronchitis, then you re really need to think very critically about what you do, especially when we start seeing this in our community, because it's really not a matter of will we see it, it's just a matter of when we see it. The Senior Citizens Center is already closed. Um, the nursing homes, the hospital, they have changed uh, their visitation um, allowances, that is, they're not allowing as many people to come in and visit. So this is where we as Christians have the opportunity to help those. If we have somebody who is higher risk and they're staying home than those who are lower risk, maybe time to step up and help do some grocery shopping, meal preparation. If you have somebody that's used to going to the Senior Citizen Center for lunch, that's not available now. And so that's a huge opportunity that we have to help them. We need to pray for our world leaders healthcare workers, first responders, scientists, and those who are sick. Our world leaders have a big responsibility with this. One, to do their best so that more people don't get sick and die. And then two, a little side note, but everybody's going to get mad at some point about getting, <laughs> having to stay in. And so they're going to have to do things in a way that, um, that allows us to still function as a society with our freedoms um, and not just get everybody upset. So creative things that we can do. Greet each other in a way that reduces risk. No handshakes, no hugs, no holy kisses. Um, one of the authors I was um, listening to on a program said that he went to a birthday party and there was a sign posted on the door that said, uh, you know, thanks for coming to our birthday party, but no hugs or handshakes today. And the author made the point that it kind of made things easier. He did not feel as awkward greeting people because there was already that ground rule set. In other words, he didn't feel bad like he was a bad guy for not giving somebody there a hug or a handshake. That's hard for us this morning. Um, as worship ended, I saw several people giving handshakes and hugs. That's our culture, and that's good, and we want to continue that. It's just now we really need to think critically about that. Um, 
change the way we meet together. So um, we have a big building here. Um, we have about 250 people who come on Sunday mornings. If we meet as a group, then we can totally spread out, um, do that social distancing thing. Um, but one of the things that we really need to utilize is the online streaming that we have. So if you are high risk or if you're sick, maybe you don't come. Um, I am presenting this information to you as a, a physician out of concern for your, um, your personal health, honestly. Um, what I do not want to do is convey an idea that we do not worship. Uh, our God has commanded us to worship, and I honor that. That is in no way negotiable with me. I will worship. But one of the things that I'm telling you is that we probably need to look creatively at how we gather together as God's people to worship. Um, as I said before, maybe shop or prepare meals for those who are the highest risk. Um, if you are somebody who normally goes to do visitation, nursing home, hospital, um, a lot of the nursing homes just don't want you there, just to be honest. Even if you're family, they really don't want you there. Um, they will check your temperature, stuff like that, ask you to fill out a questionnaire if your family member is there. Um, but they, they really don't want visitors right now. Our local hospital is restricting visitors to two people per patient, nobody 16 years old or younger, period. And I believe that also applies to Vanderbilt Hospital in Nashville. I don't know what the uh, TriStar hospitals are doing. I know they've got a screening process. I just don't know what the age and uh, number of visitors per patient can be. So that's my prepared statement, Dr. Anderson. Okay. Well, I want to thank Sam for uh, putting together that PowerPoint presentation. I just want to amplify on a couple of things that he's gone over, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, first of all, again, on the coronaviruses, there are several different coronaviruses out there. Uh, there are at least four that cause common cold. They're not very important uh, because it's a simple, self-limited illness. But what we're dealing with is uh, COVID-19, uh, and it, it appears to be much more contagious and causes a much more severe illness in some cases, especially in the elderly. The closest thing that we have seen to that in the past has been the uh, SARS epidemic back in 2003. That's uh, called severe acute respiratory syndrome and the MERS epidemic in uh, 2012 and that's the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And in those, they had a very high mortality rate, uh, sometimes over 10%. So this one, uh, you know, we're still feeling our way through. We don't have a lot of data on that. It looks like at the current time, the mortality rate overall is gonna be somewhere between three and 3.5%. And again, that'll probably go down as more and more people are tested. Our ability has been limited uh, in the past to test for that as recently as two weeks ago. Uh, it could only be done through the CDC and they were distributing kits to state health departments. And like a week ago, there were only 165 tests available in the state of Tennessee. So obviously with a population of 4 million, you can't test that many people. You have to restrict that to folks who are symptomatic and meet certain criteria. That's gonna be changing as this has been opened up to Quest and LabCorp, uh, and they're gonna be sending out thousands and probably millions of tests in the coming weeks so that, can, that we can really get some idea of how virulent this organism is. Um, so the mortality in this overall, if you take all comers, all ages, around somewhere around 3%, and compare that with the flu, uh, the mortality rate is 0.1 percent so it's it's much more dangerous than just the flu uh, sam talked a little bit about the reproductive factor of this uh, and uh, if it's if it's over one then it's going to continue to spread it's we don't have firm numbers on it but it's thought that the reproductive value of this is somewhere around 2.5 
to four. That is one person's ability to affect another as somewhere around two and a half people to maybe four people. Uh, in contrast with the flu that we commonly see, the reproductive factor on that is 1.3. And you know how fast the flu goes through the population here. If we can keep that low, if we can quarantine people, if we can limit these large gatherings, we hope to get that less than one. If it's less than one, then the virus will die out. Um, I have just uh, one chart uh, on the mortality rate uh, by age, and it will show you that the large majority of deaths from coronavirus are in those over age 60. In fact, about 80% of the deaths are. If you're 80 plus years old, the mortality rate if you get uh, coronavirus is 14.8%. And this is based on a Chinese uh, study that's just came out early last month. And it's uh, over 72,000 cases that they looked at. So if you're over 80, you get the coronavirus 14.8% death rate. 70 to 79, 8%. 60 to 69, 3.6%. 50 to 59, 1.3%. 40 to 49 years old, 0.4%. And it goes downward from there uh, to such that if the, uh, uh, if the patient's 10 to 19 years old, 0.2% chance of mortality. And in this study of 72,000 Chinese, those zero to nine years old had no fatalities. So it's very unusual. Usually we see high mortality in the very young and the very old. With this virus, we're seeing very high mortality shifted toward the elderly folks, elderly being over age 60, uh, and very little mortality uh, to the very young. And we don't understand why that is yet, but uh, that's just, just the way that it is so far. Um, we. Our treatment of this thus far for the large majority of people and for those under the age of 60, uh, it's probably gonna be a fairly mild illness. It'll be something like a cold or some bronchitis and you'll be able to just ride that out at home. Uh, and you may not even need to seek any, any sort of medical care for that. Um, if you do get sick, very sick, uh, with high fever, uh, you need to see your health care provider. You need to talk with them first over the phone. Obviously, if you're having respiratory distress, then you need to go to the emergency room and be seen. Uh, currently, the treatment is supportive. Uh, there are, uh, There is a small study of folks out on the West Coast using an antiviral uh, that's been used to treat Ebola with. And from what I'm hearing, they may be having some positive results from that. One other treatment that might be more valuable in the short term would be plasma transfusion. This has been used for actually hundreds of years, but was used back in 1918 for the 1918 flu. And what they did is take plasma from folks who had recovered from the illness and transfuse that into people who were sick. And that does work. It's been used in the 40s and 50s for measles epidemic. Uh, it was used in Ebola and also used for the bird flu. Um, one thing that you might want to know in terms of uh, symptoms, um, how do I know whether I've got a cold or whether I've got a flu or whether I've got coronavirus? Well, that's a good question uh, because it, it can vary and there's a lot of overlap there. And, you know, we, Sam and I, we have difficulty in, in the office every day trying to determine, does this person have a cold? Do they have the flu? Do they have a bacterial infection? Is it purely a viral infection? Or is it a mix of all the above? But in general, a cold is going to present with upper respiratory tract symptoms. It's going to be nasal, con nasal congestion, sneezing, stuffiness, sore throat, things like that. If you have the flu, most likely it's gonna be upper and lower tract symptoms. So in addition to the upper tract, 
you may have some cough, chest congestion, you may have some shortness of breath with that. The COVID-19 virus, primarily the symptoms are gonna be lower respiratory tract. It's gonna be a dry cough that you have generally. Uh, you're gonna have a high fever with that. Uh, and you're gonna have some systemic symptoms like fatigue and so forth. So the symptoms that you would see with coronavirus, fever in 87% of cases, and that refers back to that Chinese study that's been done, 87%. Dry cough was seen in 63% of people, fatigue in 38% of people, shortness of breath in only 18% of people. Other symptoms go way, way down from there. So, you know, diarrhea and stuff like that, it's almost non-existent with this. The toilet paper, you don't need to run out to the store and buy toilet paper. It's not gonna do you any good. If you do want to stock up on something, I would stock up on Tylenol, uh, ibuprofen, Aleve, uh, uh, facial tissues, uh, you know, something to clean surfaces with, but you don't need to go out and buy loads of, you know, whatever. You don't need to stock up on canned goods necessarily, uh, at least over two weeks worth, and you don't have to buy bottled water. Water out of the tap is gonna be just fine. So anyway, that's pretty much what I have. Uh, hope that we haven't been too long, but uh, I think we'll just open it up to questions and uh, so. Fire away with any questions that you might have. Yeah. Uh, there have been some instances of reinfection. So uh, just because you test negative for the virus or just because you have recovered or you think that you've recovered from that, you may still have some virus floating around. So you still need to be careful, okay? Uh, now, by and large, if you have it and you have the fever and a cough and all this, you get over it, you should have antibodies, but that's not to say that you couldn't get it again. It is possible. What do you see as the recovery time? I'm sure it varies, but... Yeah, it, it varies with the degree of illness, and uh, I, I would say, you know, like a couple of weeks, wouldn't you say? And one of the problems when, when we talk about this in a, from a public health standpoint is you have the question, how long is the person going to be sick? And then you have the question, how long are they contagious? And this is still stuff we don't fully know the answer to. The first answer, how long is the person going to be sick? If they have a mild case, probably a week or less. I mean, that's the problem is a lot of people probably have mild cases but are continuing to expose other people. If you have a more severe illness and are going to the hospital, you know, this is one of those situations where it could be weeks of recovery. So it can be a dramatic difference depending on the severity of illness. And the big thing is we don't know how many asymptomatic people are out there in our community that have this virus and are spreading it around unknowingly. So that's a big problem. And until we get massive testing, we won't know the numbers on that. Which goes back to kind of the plea for the social distancing and, and decreasing large gatherings. In South Korea, they have these drive-through stations set up for people to just kind of go through, get swabbed, get, go through, get swabbed, to try to identify where, um, where the largest number of people are who actually have this, and then put their efforts on those populations. We are not set up for that at this time. Any other questions? In the back. So the governor of Oklahoma got into a little bit of trouble last night or two nights ago. I think he tweeted that he and his family were at a crowded restaurant and he encouraged people to still go out and live their life. This is one of those situations where it, it kind of goes back to yes and no. 
So I went to Panera Bread for lunch. I got it to go. We didn't stay there and eat. Um, when I drove in the parking lot, just to be honest, I looked to see how many people were there. <laughs> you know, I mean, so, you know, we're going to have to live our lives, right? We're going to have to get out and do things. But I think this is where we really have to be more conscientious about what we do and where we do. If I'd walked in the door and Panera Bread was packed, I would have turned around and walked out. Um, or I would have gone through the drive through um, I love Cracker Barrel. Uh, I absolutely love Cracker Barrel. If I'm walking in Cracker Barrel's door and everybody's standing there in the um, gift shop, I'm not waiting in there for 40 minutes for my table, you know. Um, so I'm going to be getting out in the public some, but I'm going to try to be very wise about how I do that. I'm 41 years old. My dad, who I guess it's okay to say his age, but he's in his 70s, right? Sorry, Dad, if you're listening. Um, but anyway, I'm going to encourage him to be a lot more careful than me. Um, you know, and I'm going to try to do things for my parents and certainly my grandparents so they don't have to get out as much. Those of you who know my mom, she will probably do it anyway. But, um, but I'm going to try to, you know, be a su supportive of them so that they don't have to uh, get out and have uh, potentially... Um, what I would say are unnecessary exposures. And I think for right now, you just need to use good judgment. It's not such a big issue right at the current time, but in the next few weeks, we may be seeing, or we will be seeing a lot more cases, I'm sure. And I think you'll need to really scrutinize that decision to go out a little more, especially if it's still a restaurant or something like that, that's not a necessary trip. Uh, so if it's not necessary, it's best to stay at home, uh, and particularly if this thing spreads more and more. Brother King? What about the people that work with cooks and serving restaurants? Is there some kind of particular thing they need to do? Is there somewhere they need to be screened or what? Well, I know they're, they're ramping up their efforts to uh, make sure they have everything cleaned, and you know, the grocery stores, they're closing early. Uh, they're gonna not only restock these items that they're running out of, but to do some extra cleaning. And our, the CDC and the, um, OSHA have released some statements with recommendations for employers. Um, basically right now, you know, if you're an employee of a company where they can send you home and you can work for home, a lot, a lot of the companies are doing that. For those people who have a job where they have to go in um, and work, then most of the recommendations now are related to cleaning and as much as possible trying to not be in crowded groups of people uh, for prolonged periods of time. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that's being looked at uh, and the sort of cutoff range on that has been anywhere from 100 to 100.4 uh, and they're trying to come out with more of a consensus on that but it, that gives you a rough idea if your temperature is above 100 yeah we start getting concerned if it's less than 100 you know it's probably something else right now Many times older patients don't have as much of a fever response as younger patients. So if I have a 20 or a 30 year old and they have a temperature of 100, I'm usually not as concerned. If I have a patient who's in their 70s and they have a temperature of 100 or higher, I have a little bit higher suspicion for them. Um, so I think Dr. Anderson's right. If you're 60 and above and you have a temperature of 100, that doesn't mean you have something bad. It doesn't mean you have this guaranteed. It's just I would pay more attention to it. Yes, sir. Could somebody help me out? What was the question? What can you use to prevent catching it? So that's where probably the best um, way to prevent catching it is not get around people who are sick. <laughs> and washing hands. Wash your hands. And it doesn't have to be antibacterial soap. It doesn't have to be the Purell. Just plain old soap and water and just wash your hands for tw at least 20 seconds. It should be good.
Any other questions? And if you think of something later, you're welcome to ask me. I'm sure Dr. Anderson as well. Yes? Do you make house calls? <laughs> that is a great question. Yeah, so we have, when I say we, I mean our office, I'm sure Dr. Anderson has as well, have, have really tried to brainstorm about creative ways to deliver health care. Um, one of the problems is, you know, if I think about what I do and Dr. Anderson does, we're probably high risk, right? I mean, that's the thing is, is we're going to have to be very conscientious so we don't end up. So um, to your point about house calls, maybe asked as somewhat of a joke, but honestly, a really good question. I mean, realistically, a really good question. Um, we will probably try to roll out, when I say we, healthcare workers in this community, to roll out some um, like telemedicine type things, FaceTiming, and, and do some more stuff by phone that we did not do in the past. Not that that's a better way to deliver care, but maybe for the short term a safer way for some things. So um, yeah, I mean it would be okay to ask um, your um, primary care provider if you end up needing something that's not a big deal, hey, temporarily, is there a way I can get what I need without um, physically coming in? Yes, sir. I think it's interesting in Nashville, they're setting up tents away from the doctor's offices, maybe in parking lots and warehouses and mm -hmm. things, keep things more. I see people waiting out in their cars and they're calling. That's right. And I think the screening at Vanderbilt Hospital downtown, uh, it's going to be through a tent, and you go in there and you're going to get your temperature taken, and they're going to ask you some questions before they'll let you go in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. If, if you happen to touch a doorknob that someone that's sick touched it, the, the virus can't get into your body unless you actually put your hand inside of your mouth or your eyes or your nose or have a cut on your hand? Or, do you, or can it be, can you catch it just by having it on your hand? So that's generally true. In other words, if you have it on your hand, you would have to then, like I just did, <laughs> uh, touch your face, a mucous membrane specifically, which would be your mouth, um, through your eyes, your nose, something like that, um, or if you have a cut. So in general, yes, that's true. For um, the uh, most of the viruses we're familiar with and coronavirus, so I think it's probably going to be true for this, but we're still learning about it, but probably true. We touch our faces dozens of times a day. You can't avoid touching your face. So your, your best option is just to wash those hands, keep them clean. Uh, you know, your doorknobs and stuff at home, keep those clean. Uh, uh, faucets, stuff like that. Keep it as clean as you can. You can't el totally eliminate all the risk, but just keeping clean hands so that when your hand does touch your face, you're not transferring virus. So does the, the gel, the sanitary gel? It's, it, it works uh, somewhat, it certainly works better than nothing, but actually the best thing is soap and water. It's better than that. And if you're gonna use a hand sanitizer, 60% alcohol base is recommended. Um, not all uh, hand sanitizers or like wipes are, um, are going to do be as thorough in terms of uh, killing germs. Um, I'm not advocating you get like bleach or disinfecting wipes like what you'd use a countertop for, but not all products are created equal. And the antibacterial soaps, as Dr. Anderson said, it does not have to be an antibacterial soap. Plain soap um, and water is very effective. To clean a countertop or surface would be fine. Bleach uh, can damage the skin, so I usually don't recommend people use bleach on their skin uh, for something like this. Yeah, well, it's like half a cup per gallon of water. So if you wanted something really cheap, uh, just do that. Half a cup of Clorox in some water. You can wipe down all your counters with that, and it should eliminate probably 99% of germs. In terms of the disinfectants that are out there, uh, the Clorox, disinfectant wipes and Lysol are two of the well-known approved uh, disinfectants out there. The CDC actually has, I think, like a six-page list of commercially available products. If you want to look up and just make sure what you have is effective, you can look it up on their list.
Anything else? All right. Thank hey, thank you so much. I hope everybody has a good night.